Okay, <laughs> we're live now. We want to say hi. This is Unraveled Hearts um, Bible Study. We meet every Tuesday night, either in Harlingen, La Feria, or the San Benito area. We encourage you to plug in to come to the table. If you are somewhere in these cities, you know, uh, you can find us on this page and find us where we're going to be every Tuesday. And it's just women from all walks of life, different churches coming together and learning straight from the Word of God, having wonderful discussions, um, meeting and um, having dinner together and all of that. Now we're going to dive into the Word. If for some reason you are not nearby or you just cannot make it to the table, then this is the second best thing. And I encourage you to plug in, to stay plugged in the whole hour, and I guarantee you that you will learn something. We are now in number 16, but we're gonna start with the book of Proverbs. And we're just doing one scripture, and that is uh, Proverbs 10, 9, correct? Or 10, yes. 9. So we're doing, we do a little bit, one scripture of the proverb, and then we're doing the, uh, the chapter we're going through numbers the book of numbers as well and susan kroger is actually teaching numbers this time around Not um, numbers. i mean uh sorry <laughs> proverbs teaching the proverb this time and so she has stuff to share with that and she's gotten better every time and i'm looking forward to what she's got uh for us so we go to proverbs uh 10 9 proverbs 10 9 did you memorize the verses? I did not memorize the verse. Did I. You know, I was talking to my husband about that because we need to be better about just memorizing scripture. It renews the mind when you memorize. And I was um, working on a psalm. But yes. Okay, so 10, 9. We need, we need to be back on target with that. To be able to memorize Next week is going to be Proverbs 10.10. 10. So it's one verse. You can memorize it. When you memorize the word of God, you are renewing your mind. Um, there's a lot of things in the spiritual that are happening when you are putting the word of God in your heart and in your mind. So we want to see. That's a challenge out there to all of you. Proverbs 10.10 10 next Tuesday. But right now we're at 10.9. Go for it. Okay, I'm going to pray. Dear Lord, yes. please uh, be with us today, Lord. Thank you for being with us. Yes, God. Help us to honor and serve you, and please uh, help me say what you want me to say. Hallelujah. Uh, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, so Proverbs 10, 9. He who walks with integrity walks surely, but he who perverts his ways will become known. Um, walks surely means a person has no reason to fear that anything will be able to be brought out against them because they've lived their life with integrity, which means um, they have uh, the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles. They've honored God with their life and there are no skeletons in their closet. But he who perverts his way, perverts means um, to alter from its original course, meaning or state to a distortion or corruption of what was first intended. Uh, so to distort, warp, corrupt, twist, abuse, and misuse. <clears throat> but he who perverts his way will be known uh, known meaning you'll be found out. And, okay. Could you imagine living your life worrying that you'll be found out because you did something so horrible you're trying to hide from the truth? Every day being afraid that one day it will be discovered what you did or hiding from punishment. Um, Numbers 15, 32 through 36, which we read mm -hmm. part of, we read that last week, uh, came to mind when I was studying this. And that is, now while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man gathering sticks on the Sabbath. 
And those who found him gathering sticks brought him to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation. They put him under guard because it had been, it had not been explained what should be done to him. Then the Lord said to Moses, the man must surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones outside the camp. So as the Lord commanded Moses, all the congregation brought him outside the camp and stoned him with the stones and he died. He was uh, rebellious against God's command of uh, resting on the Sabbath and not working. He knew he should have gathered sticks earlier in the week. He had a rebellious heart and those were, that was re the result of his rebellion. And he, so he knew he was doing wrong. He knew, you know, something was going to happen to him eventually. He just didn't think anybody would find out. Um, but they did, and he died for his mistakes. Okay, now, uh, here's an example of someone who was... Look, had to look over her shoulder every single day and new punishment was coming. Um, to her neighbors in Queens, New York, she was known as the nice lady who didn't make the little boy pay when he accidentally threw a baseball through her window. To the inmates at Ravensbrook and Majdanek concentration camps, she was known as the mayor because she brutally kicked them with her iron-tipped boots and cussed at them kicking and hitting them, not caring where she made contact with the helpless prisoners. Um, she was directly involved. She's the one who decided to send 50 sick Jewish women and 20 Jewish children to die in the gas chambers. She was behind the cynically named November 3rd, 1943 Harvest Festival in which 17,000 inmates were shot at open graves. Uh, she had also served two short prison terms. She had a criminal past. She had not told her American husband or US authorities when she came to the United States. When she was finally discovered by the Nazi hunter Ryan Weis Weisenthal, she said, I knew this would happen, you've come. That is just an excellent example of someone who they knew they had done wrong and they knew judgment was coming. Mm -hmm. And she got a life sentence in Germany in 1972. Um, her corrupt ways had become known to all. She knew it and would, knew it would happen one day, always looking over her shoulder. Um, there are people living their lives, looking over their shoulders wherever they go, and possibly, and possibly their sins might not be discovered while they're alive, but when they die and their time of judgment comes, their sins will be found out. God knows what we do. He knows our hearts when we do it, and uh, I just pray that we will walk with integrity following closely after the Lord, that we will live according to his word and follow Christ's teachings. That, there you go. So when you walk in integrity, you don't, you're not always hiding. Yes. You're not always, you know, are they going to find out? <laughs> and, and someone who walks in perverted ways and perverted, the word just means twisted. Um, that's why we call people, a lot of times we call them perverts, but perverts is because their mind is twisted. So it's not just necessarily a sexual thing, it's just that their thinking is twisted. And so I like how uh, you brought this woman up. There are so many people living like they're living on the run or just, you know, because their life uh, is twisted and they've had crooked and dark ways and um, they went a, a different way that they're always thinking, when am I going to get caught or when are things going to catch up to me? And some people think they never will get caught because they're just so awesome. Mm -hmm. They did such a good job. But 
they will they will when they die the base judgment so it's just yeah and, and I would I thought of the Psalms 23 4 when we walk um, with the Lord yeah though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death I will fear no evil for you are with me uh, your rod and your staff they comfort me so even when we walk in darkness when there's evil all around us when we are surrounded by the enemy that we know that he is with us and we're gonna be okay it's it's that same um, Holy Spirit reminder your days are numbered. Like, I got you. If your time is up, your time is up. If it's not, then don't worry about it. You know, it's not something that um, that we have to fear. Okay, so see how those are one-liners, beautiful proverbs that we can be learning, like we can be regurgitating them at a time of... of uh, at a time when when we're struggling um, or when we need that to come up hide the word in your heart so it can be there when you need it and we always need it okay so let's go to now number 16 and I love how when we're done with the proper Susan takes off <laughs> I don't want to be caught by the camera so, <laughs> yes she's still here She's still here. So we're gonna go through number 16. Some of you, I, I want, I want, let it be a lesson last Tuesday that it is very possible to do one chapter in one night. That can be done. However, it is not necessarily um, you know, the norm, not for us, because what happens. The norm, the norm is that we leave no stone unturned. So if there is a need to stay and grapple with the verses and really learn, then we're not just going to speed through it just to say, check mark, we did this chapter, right? So I feel like 16, that's what it's going to be. It feels like it's going to grab onto us. It's going to stick around for a while, okay? So number 16, the word was rebellion, and we had a good discussion about rebellion, okay? We want to talk a little bit about, because Kiara, Kiara, I'll <laughs> oh, learn it, Kiara is here, and we want to kind of let her in on what's been going on with the book of numbers. So let's tell her, everyone, the book of numbers. What what have we been doing? What's been happening in the book of Numbers Walking. since we lost? Since we last, uh, when, did, when did we come here? Um, two months ago. Two months ago. It's been a while. Yeah. yeah. But you can always follow us yeah. on a Tuesday, <laughs> wherever we're at. Um, so we, um, the they were getting organized. They were becoming an army. They went through a lot of struggles. There was a lot of um, complaining. There was a lot of um, getting them back together, getting them to uh, getting them to uh, to realize who their God was, and then to go into the promised land and reject it, and then and then realizing that that made God really mad. And what did he say? He said, no, okay, that's fine. You're not going to go into the promised land. And it's funny how after God said, you know, they didn't even want the promised land. And then God says, you know what? Okay, you're not going into the promised land. Oh, but now we want it. <laughs> and they wanted to go back. And they, want, they wanted the promised land. And that's not how it works. It was too late. I said, go back, go back. You're going to wander in the desert. You're going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. For those 40 years until that generation dies off. This generation was to die without ever fulfilling its purpose. Without ever fulfilling its destiny. And it was so sad to, to have to witness that. To have that front row seat to it all. And then we saw 15 
Chapter 15 is going back to the basics, back to the basics of laws and rules and, and things that God wanted them, how he wanted them to live because he is a holy God. So he wanted them to be holy, not because we have a mean God, but rather we have a powerful holy God that cannot be around sinful people. And so therefore there had to be sacrifices, there had to be rituals, there had to be things that were done so they could, so that he could live um, amongst them because that's what he wanted he wanted to dwell you know none of the other gods that other nations have been worshiping are gods that want to dwell uh in their midst that wanted to dwell in their midst and here was a god that created them that created us wants to dwell in our midst and he still desires that he wants to dwell inside of us and that's jesus and that's through the holy spirit he dwells in us we are now the tabernacle okay so now we're at 16, okay? And so we kind of got a little bit, uh, and then if you have questions, this is the time, because it's just a few of us, so this is the time to really, hey, you know, what do you mean about this? Or what, what happened, you know, when we read this? Or, or, or such and such. The, this is a good time for that, because all we're going to do tonight is get our little toes wet. Like if you imagine going to the beach and you kind of put your toes in the water, that's what we're doing with this chapter. We are setting the stage. We're setting the stage for what God wants to teach us through this chapter, which I believe is going to be an incredible journey, an incredible transformation of the heart, incredible revelation, uh, revolution of the heart, right? So I'm going to pray and I'm going to settle our hearts so that we can continue on, okay? Spirit of the living God, we ask that you take over right now. Holy Spirit, we ask that you come, that you dwell among us now, that your presence is felt here, Father God, that we, we need your presence. We need Holy Spirit to take over and lead us into all truth. Any distraction must go in Jesus' name. We ask for any distraction to be gone in Jesus name, any distraction of the mind, any distraction of the heart that is tugging at us that the enemy would love for us to be rocky ground right now or, or, way, or, or uh, by the wayside, seeds that get thrown by the wayside, but we want to be good ground right now. So Lord, settle our hearts and settle our minds so that all of the seeds of this word can penetrate us deep, God, and can blossom and can uh, bring forth fruit for you, Lord. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, chapter 16. So here we are. Verse one, two, three. Um, <clears throat> Kiara, can you do us the honors of reading um, chapter uh, 16, one to three? Yes. Um, so I'm gonna like pronounce these wrong, but. That's okay, that's okay. <laughs> Sometimes we, yeah, we just kind of make them up. <laughs> I will fix them. Korah, son of uh, Izar, the son of Korah. Kohath? Kohath? Kohath. Okay. Kohath, mm -hmm. the son of Zebai and certain Rebunite, 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 mm -hmm. Dathan and Abiram, mm -hmm. sons of Ila, and On, son of Peleg, become insolent and rose up against Moses. With them were 250 Israelite men well-known community leaders who had been appointed me members of the council. They came as a group to oppose Moses and Aaron and said to them, you have gone too far. The whole community is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is with them. Why then do you set yourselves above the Lord's assembly? Okay. All right, this is tough verses, okay? Um, Miss Brenda, I'm going to have you reread it so you can settle your heart as, as you're joining us back. So just 16, 1 to 3. Okay. Korah, son of Ishar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, <coughs> and certain Reubenites, Dathan, and Abraham, son of Eliab, and On, son of Peleth, became insolent and rose up against Moses. When there were 250 Israelite men, well-known community leaders who had been appointed members of the council, 
They came as a group of they came as a group to oppose Moses and Aaron and said to them, You have gone too far. The whole community is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is with them. Why then do you set yourselves above the Lord's assembly? Okay. Do you see what's going on here? Okay. I, I want you to get, get this picture, and I want you to also get a little bit of background because they are grieving the loss of a dream. They are grieving the loss of a future. They are grieving the loss of destiny and purpose. I want you to, to also understand that about the Israelites. We now know that there's a grieving process to things, right? And when there's a loss, there are, there are steps, you know, that you're going to go through emotionally and mentally because, uh, because we are human. And that's how... And that's a lot of times how things happen. Now, they didn't have, well, throughout, the, they, they've had some losses because you, some of the, the ones who, who didn't believe in going to the promised land, they did die. So there are people that physically died, but also there is a death of destiny that they are now hearing. In chapter 15, they were part of hearing everything that this next generation is going to get to do okay and they are having to hear it knowing that they will never get to do that they will never get to fulfill their purpose and their destiny and be truly free and truly have their land and do everything that god had for them okay so these people are distraught and they're going through this grieving process some of them are really angry. Some of them haven't accepted it yet. Some of them are sad, okay? So, so all of these different emotions that kind of are setting in here. And so now they are coming to Aaron and Moses. Some of the, some of the, the leaders are coming. Remember, we, we've had, um, and these were appointed, well-known men, are coming to Aaron and Moses and going, you're not the only holy one. God doesn't only just speak to you. We're all his children. So they're coming with some strong accusations. They're not questions. They're accusations. They're coming to them and they're, it's blown. It's, it's true rebellion is what's starting to happen here. It's the onset at the onset of, of this. It's like a stirring. It's like, you know, there's a disturbance in the forest and we can feel it. Um, so I want you to get like the picture of what's happening and then we're going to unpack it slowly. And then if you have, if Holy Spirit gives you a thought or gives, stirs your heart in a certain direction that you need to share, please do, please do, because I think it'll add to our lesson. It'll add to our learning. Okay. So, so stop me or, or, you know, interject and, and make sure that you, uh, you add what, what Holy Spirit's putting in your heart, okay? All right, so I'm a, a kid from the 80s generation. I grew up in the 80s, okay? That generation is known as Generation X for a good reason, okay? We were rebellious to the core, okay? It's the onset of MTV, the onset of all, you know, we were latchkey kids as well because now the moms, you know, most of the moms were working, right? So there was a lot of stuff that was happening. And of course, the, the, our friends and media was uh, adding to that, to, hey, you know, you can, you know, uh, be rebellious. I can do my own thing. This is my life, right? So I know, and at that time, we wore our rebellion like a badge of honor, okay? It was encouraged. Um, so... The thing is, we still live, it's just a little bit more subdued or not so much in your face like it was in the 80s, but there is still um, rebellion that is promoted um, in our culture. Rebellion is encouraged. Rebellion is promoted. Most, I mean, I, I have never seen the type of rebellion that we're seeing to, today against a president of the United States. It's not just you know, the person, it is no respect for the 
position at all. So we're seeing we're seeing that um, just come come into play here in our country. So um, a lot of times it's just being rebellious for rebellious sake, you know. Yeah, I don't do that because and they don't even know why. It's just like ah, I don't do that. But it, that's where we coined the phrase, you know, the rebel without a cause, because they just want to be rebellious for rebellious sake. Like, be different when it matters, people. Okay, <laughs> be different when it makes a difference. Don't just like you don't even know what you represent or what your cause is. Um, but what exactly is rebellion and how does it affect us, okay? More importantly, what does God think about it? Because we know we can go to dictionary.com and we can get the definition of rebellion. And here it is. Rebellion, according to dictionary.com, is an act of violence or open resistance to an established government or ruler. Um, the action or process of resisting authority, uh, control, or convention, an uprising, defiance, disobedience, okay? But now we're going to do a little scavenger hunt through our Bible, and we're going to look at rebellion through the Word of God. What does God say rebellion is, and, and how does it affect us? So let, let's go to 1 Samuel 12. 1 Samuel 12. Oh, I'm feeling it. We're, we're starting. Thank mm -hmm. you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I feel like it's, it's uh, God is here. And God is going to teach us something. 14 through 15. Uh, Hannah, can you read that? 1 Samuel 12, chapter 12, 14 through 15. What? Chapter 12, verse 14 through 15, First Samuel. <clears throat> the people feared the Lord and served him and obeyed his voice, did not rebel against the command of the Lord. And if you and the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God, it will be well. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the command of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you and your king. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it, I love, it. in my uh, translation, it says, however, <laughs> there's always like, if you do this, then this will happen. However, if you choose to do this, then this is what's going to happen. So however, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandments of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you. Okay, to actually have, when did we see that? Remember when um, the Israelites wanted to go back up the mountain and fight um, the, what is it, the Amalekites, I believe, and, and, um, and the hand of God was actually against them. Like to have God as an enemy mm -hmm. is tragic. Stay in 1 Samuel. We're going to go to 1 Samuel 15, 23. 1 Samuel 15, 23, and uh, Stephanie, can you read that? For rebellion is like the sin of divination, divination? Mm -hmm. and defiance is like wickedness and idolatry, because you have rejected the word of the Lord. He has rejected you as king. Okay. Kiara, can you read 23 again? Yes. For rebellion is like the sin of divination and arrogance like the evil of idolatry because you have rejected the word of the Lord. He has rejected you as king. Okay. So, so yeah. So divination. What is divination? It's witchcraft, right? So think about this. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Okay, I want that to like sit with you. I want you to, to, to get that. When you rebel, when you become, when someone is rebellious, it's like if they were practicing witchcraft. Okay, 
So that is, you know, that I want the weight of that on your spirit. Stubbornness is as iniquity. Iniquity is sin. It's a fancy word for saying sin. So stubbornness is sin and idolatry. Okay? So we can be like, oh yeah, I'm not like them. I know, you know, I'm not a Satan worshiper. I don't have idols. I, you know, I, I'm not in sin. But if you have a rebellious spirit, if you have a rebellious heart, it's as if you were all of those things because that's exactly how the Word of God defines rebellion. I had a, 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 a missionary friend of mine that her son at 14, he, you know, he became, he, he is a very strong man and he's a hunter and he's, you know, he's a guy's guy. But a lot of times raising a guy that's going to be strong and, and a leader is kind of difficult because they're a little stubborn and strong-willed. Um, but his heart was so much for the Lord that he would get angry at his parents and he would just like, well, you could, you could see him just sulking in that and he go, and then, you know, uh, and he would always say, Miss Giovanna, yeah, I'm not going to go against what my parents say because rebellion is a sin of witchcraft. <laughs> he would just quote the word of God and he just like, he was reminding himself like, oh, you know, I'm so angry, but I'm still going to obey my parents because I don't want to practice witchcraft. <laughs> and I thought like the fact that they can have a 14 year old boy that gets it, you know, and, and has that heart, it was amazing to me. And now, of course, you see the result of that as he's already, you know, a young man in his 30s. But so let's look at Proverbs 17, 11. Proverbs 17, 11. We're going to And let's get there, whoever gets there first. Proverbs 17, 11. Who has that? Can you read it, please, whoever has it? An evil man seeks only rebellion, and a cruel messenger will be sent against him. Okay. An evil man seeks only rebellion. Okay, so we're getting a clearer picture of what the Word of God says about rebellion. So it's evil, it's this witchcraft, okay, and a cruel messenger. Again, something against, against. He's going to get a message and it's going to be against him, okay? Um, Isaiah 63.10, they're hanging out with the prophets. Isaiah uh, 63 10. Stephanie, go ahead. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit, so he became their enemy and fought against them. So we're seeing this pattern that when we rebel against God, when we rebel against obedience, when uh, the things that he wants us to do, the direction he wants us to go, when we rebel, God becomes our enemy. He turns against, okay? So I want you to see that. Stay in Isaiah. We're going to go to 65.2. 65.2. Miss Brenda, can you read that? All day long I have held out my hands to an obstinate people who walk in ways not good, pursuing their own imagination. Okay. And then, of course, the another translation says, I have stretched out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good according to their own thoughts. Okay? So our own thoughts. We have learned in past Bible study that his desires that, you know, a lot of times we have, um, we have uh, preachers that say, oh, God wants you to have the desires of your heart. But what have we learned about that? That 
our desires become his desires. When you are connected to the Lord, then he drops and downloads desires. And so you're actually praying and desiring the things that he wants for you. Okay. So here we're seeing that uh, they walk according to their own thoughts. So it's their, what they want. Okay. Then let's go to Psalm 68, 6. We're going to beat this thing to death. Psalm 68. And it's good. I love when I hear those pages. Okay. Because it's devices are great. Technology is great. But I'm glad when you're learning how to navigate through your Bible. Psalm 68, 6. Okay. Uh, Honda, can you read that? God settles the solitary in the home. He leads out the prisoners to prosperity, but the rebellious dwell in a parched land. Okay. So we have a description here of God says the solitary in family. So someone who is alone, he unites with people. He brings out those who are bound into prosperity. But the rebellious dwell in a dry, parched land. There's nothing uh, but barrenness for a rebellious people. Okay? And last one, Deuteronomy 28. So that's the, the one right after Numbers. Deuteronomy 28. 47 through 48. 47 through 48. Um, Susan, can you read that, please? 47, okay. Because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and gladness of heart for the abundance of everything, therefore you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you in hunger and thirst and nakedness, and in need of everything, and he will put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you. Okay. So again, because you didn't serve, because you didn't serve the Lord, you didn't obey the Lord, this is what's going to happen. Okay. So over and over in the Old Testament, we can see that rebellion is as witchcraft. Rebellion is bad. It's evil. And that God hates it. And that God will put his hand against it. Okay, but now what does Jesus say about that? Okay, um, New Testament, Luke 6, 46. Matthew, Mark, uh, Luke, right? 6, 46. And Kiana, can you read that? Why do you call me Lord? Oh my gosh, why do you call me Kiana? <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't know your name. I'm trying. I'm not sure yet. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Um, 646. I mean, what? Yes. 646. 646. Go. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? I do not do what I say. Okay. So that's Jesus saying, why in the heck are you saying Lord? To say Lord is to say that, hey, you've got everything. I surrender everything to you. You are my everything. Why do you do that? And then you don't obey me. Okay? And then this is what Paul shows us in Hebrews. Go to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 3. Can you read that? Hebrews 3.15. Uh, read 15 and... I'm still trying to find it. It's past yeah. Timothy. So Hebrews is right after 2 Timothy, Philemon, and then Hebrews. Yeah, 
Hebrews what? Hebrews chapter 3, uh, 15 through 19. As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, and do not, and do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who were those who hardened and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses, which with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness, and whom did not swear that they did not enter his rest? But in those who were disobedient, so we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Okay. So Paul is, is trying to teach the Christians, uh, the believers in Christ. Now this side of the cross, right? He's trying to tell them, hey, do not be like those rebellious Israelites, you know, who Moses, is, who Moses left. Let's go stay in Hebrews and go to chapter 13. 13, 17. What book? Hebrews. Hebrews 13, so the same book, 17. Hannah, can you read that, please? for you wow okay so here um, this is Paul explaining that and let's go to Ephesians 5 6 he says for they watch over your souls that's why pastors teachers ministers are are held to a higher standard because they are responsible for every word that comes out of their mouth for they are, are having to shepherd someone's soul and it says, please don't give them grief, for it'll be unprofitable to you. Let's go to Ephesians 5. Ephesians. That's right before a Philippians 5, 6. Stephanie, you want to read? 526? 5, 6. Let no one deceive you with empty arguments, for God's wrath is coming on the disobedient because of these things. Okay. So God's wrath, it's the same theme from the Old Testament. God's wrath coming on those that are disobedient. And disobedience is rebellion. Okay? So hopefully you got a, a clear picture of rebellion and how God views it and how God sees it according to scripture. It is evident that rebellion is disobedience towards God and his word, okay? So now the Israelites, we're going to learn that firsthand. The Israelites didn't have the New Testament. <laughs> they didn't even have, you know, the, the book of Numbers because they weren't living out the book of Numbers. So they were, they're a picture for us. Everything they were doing is um, a narrative for us to learn from, a picture for us to look at and go, yeah, we should not do that. So they, we should be thankful for their lives because they are pointing us to Jesus the whole time. Okay, so the Israelites are going to learn this firsthand and be an example to us to not rebel. Now, let's look at those verses. So now let's go back to number 16. And who was rebelling? Let's look at who was rebelling, okay? Sometimes we can go through those names and we stumble through them and we laugh. But we need to pay attention to those names. Because those names, there is nothing written in the Word of God for no reason. There's not a name that is given for no reason, right? There is a reason for it all. So here, um, who are the ones rebelling? Can you guys just call them out? Korah. Okay. Mm, Kohath? No. 
some cool hats and believe it. I don't even know what that's just doing. Dathan and Athram. Dathan, that's a cool name. That's like Nathan, but with a D. Dathan, okay. A Byram. A Byram, okay. On. Uh, yes, and this is so funny because I kept reading it and I'm like, okay, and on the son of, why were they on the son of Pellet? Why? I don't get it. I kept thinking that. But then if the name is on, his name is on. Can you imagine if you had twins, you could call them on and off. But he was called on. <laughs> and, and with that, Melba enters into the room. You look super cute, like Dora the Explorer. <laughs> so there, there is a name. Can you imagine the next time a pregnant mom asks you to what should their they name their kid? Say on. It's in the Bible. <laughs> okay, so we have Cora, Dana, Dana, Dathan, my goodness, it's so easy, it's Nathan, but with a name, Dathan, Abiram, and On, okay? So these are like, Cora um, went and got these other people, it says he pulled them apart, okay? He, he got them and he grabbed them and he says, come, where this is what, you know, he was leading the whole thing. Now watch this. Korah is the son of Issachar, but also is the son from the descendants of the Kohathites, the Kohaths. But the Kohathites should sound familiar to you because we've talked about them. So this is very interesting. They come from the tribe of Levi. Can you tell me about the tribe of Levi? What did God have for them? What what? The Levites. What were they supposed to do? They're the priests, right? They were chosen, set apart to have work in the tabernacle, okay? Whether they were priests or had a specific job, they were to be set apart, okay? But watch this. Even closer. So, so Korah was part of the Levite tribe, which already tells you this is a chosen tribe. These are like, uh, you know, the, the the ministers, like if it was a church, that was the family minister, okay? So you have that, right? But not only that, the, he came from the Kohathites. The Kohathites, and we're going to talk about this a little more, have a very interesting and important position in the tabernacle and with through the Levites, okay? Then we have Dathan and I... Uh, I Abiram. Abiram. Abi what did you say? Abiram. I like how that sounded. Abiram. Um, so this is from the tribe of Reuben. Okay? The son of Elia. But but these are come from the tribe of Reuben. And then, so, so here's Korah hanging out or pulling people away from the tribe of, the, of Reuben. And this guy on. Okay? He's on. <laughs> I'm just having so much fun with that name. On. Okay, so he is from the tribe of Reuben, okay? So watch this. I just thought this was so interesting. I want you to go, up because you might not remember when we studied Numbers chapter 4. So let's go to Numbers 4, 2 through 5. 2 through 4, I'm sorry. Numbers 4. So we're just going back for like like a rewind like a flashback okay hopefully this will all come back to you it's all coming back to you okay this was a super fun chapter and this chapter dealt a lot with leadership which i thought was fair i mean this kept just sticking out like a sore thumb to me so numbers four two through four uh are you are okay stephanie go ahead and read it among the Levites take a census of the Kohathites by their clans and their ancestral houses, men from 30 years old to 50 years old, everyone who is qualified to do work at the tent of meeting. The service of the Kohathites at the tent of meeting concerns the most holy objects. Whenever the camp is about, about to move on, Aaron and his sons are to Okay, move. wait, wait, to four. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Sorry. Okay. So 
I want you to understand what's happening here. He's assigning their clans. Okay, so you have tribes, and those tribes are made of families, which are called clans. Okay, so these are different families. Okay, so the co you have the Kohathite family. Okay, so let's say the Martinez family. You know, you have different families that make up a tribe. Okay, the Martinez, the Perales, the Perez, you know, whatever. All of these families make up a tribe. So the Kohathites were a clan. And then you have the Gershonites, and then you have the Merorites. Okay, so you have these three families. There's a lot of families, but these three families had very important jobs, of which the Kohathites had the most important job, which was they were, whenever they were to move, remember they had the tabernacle? So there were things in the tabernacle that were made of gold, very precise, and they were holy things. You couldn't touch them. If you touched them, and um, you would die. It, they were holy things for the Lord. So when um, he had the Kohathite family carry these holy things, they were the only ones that could carry it, and they had to be carried a certain way or they would die. So you have a very important, not only were they Levites, they were one of the very important clans, very important family in the Levite family was this Korah guy from, okay? So I want you to understand that. He was up there as far as the important people in, in the Levites, okay? The people that God had chosen to minister to the Israelites, okay? Now Korah is leading this rebellion, okay? With Moses and Aaron. But he's pairing up. He's not necessarily, he, we'll see more Levites in this, but the main instigators that he's pairing up with come from the tribe of Reuben, okay? So this is where allow Holy Spirit to teach us from this, okay? So an insider pairing up, an insider, why am I calling him an insider? Because you have the tabernacle and around the tabernacle were the Levites, okay? They were be, they were, uh, everything having to do with exactly what Moses, God would speak to Moses, and then um, Moses would, before, you know, he, he, they would know what was happening before anybody else did. They would know the things that were the ins and the outs of the tabernacle. They had instruction, not only did they have instruction, but they had that connection to Moses right then and there. They were uh, protectors of the presence of God. They were on the inside, okay? So the insider pairing up with uh, some Reubenites, some people from another tribe to stir up trouble. So linking, I want you to, to, to hear what we can learn from this, okay? Linking arms with the wrong people, okay, can be devastating. Linking arms with the wrong people can be devastating. This is the difference between Levi and Reuben. Look at what their father had to say, and then look at what God did. And I want us to learn from this. What did um, Jacob, their father, have to say? We're not going to go there, but I want you to, to keep this in mind. Genesis 49 is when Jacob is dying, and all his sons are around him, and he's going to bless them, okay? So in, in Genesis 49, 6, 49, 7, uh, 5 through 7. You know what? Let's just go there really quick. <laughs> and we'll just have Melba read um, Genesis 49, 5 through 7. This is what Jacob is telling um, Simeon and Levi. Okay? Now, remember, these sons are already grown, but they have given Jacob grief. These guys went and killed a whole bunch of people that had to have Jacob and them on the run, their family on the run because of his rebellious, violent children. Because 
It was a long story, but someone raped their sister and the way they dealt with it is, okay, we're going to go and kill everybody in that town, all the men in that <laughs> town. That's, a, that's a, a, a Taken movie before there was Taken. Okay, so here we go. So let's see what Jacob says about his sons. Now that he's dying, now that they're older, what is he saying? Simeon and Levi are brothers. Their swords are implements of violence. Let my soul not enter into their counsel. Let not my glory be united with their assembly, because in their anger they slew men, and in their self-will they lamed oxen. Cursed be their anger, for it is feared, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will disperse them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Okay. So he gave them a bad, like a bad background, uh, like what is it when you, your record is smeared? <laughs> like he's like, yeah, these guys are violent. Okay, I, these are my boys, but they're violent. And he said this: cursed is their anger. He didn't curse them; he cursed their anger, the source of their rage and the way they sin. Right. So. It's not quite certain why God decided to use these very people that came from Levi, okay, um, to use them as the priest, to use them as the ministers, okay? Not Simeon, but the Levites. We get a clue of God's uh, reason or why God, God checks out the heart. He always looks at the heart. So in, in Exodus 32, when, when uh, Moses was up on the mountain and then he comes down with the commandments, right? And they're having a what? They're having like orgies and stuff going on, party, big festival, you know? And then they have this golden calf, right? This golden calf. Well, Moses was very angry about that. God was very angry about that. And one of the ones that helped them bring punishment to everybody was the Levites. Moses said, okay, come over here. You're going to help me, you know, deal, punish. And by punish, you know, kill with a sword those who were against the Lord. Those who uh, don't want to be on God's side. And they uh, went and said, okay, we're siding with Moses. We're siding on God's side. And talk about turning your passion and anger for God's for God's uh, will and God's um, and the and the service of the Lord. That's what was happening here. We don't hear of of Simeon um, tribe doing any such thing, but we start seeing the the Levite tribe have this kind of change of heart, change of mind in their ways, and so th that could be a you know confirmation of. God's sovereign way of looking into the hearts of the Levites. The Levites were chosen to be God's holy people. But Reuben, watch this. Reuben, the same blessing, and Melba, will you read that again? Genesis 49, 2 through 4. Reuben is the oldest son, Jacob's oldest son from Leah, the woman Jacob was married to, never loved, you know, loved her because she was a mother of children, but there was not the love that he had for Rachel, right? So Reuben, he, he, this is his blessing on Reuben. Can you read, Melba? Gather together and hear, O sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel, your father. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power, uncontrolled as water. You shall not have preeminence, because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. Okay, so this guy was terrible. Basically, what he's saying is, oh, you're my firstborn. You have, you know, the strength and all this thing. He says, uh, yeah, but you're unstable. You're unstable in all your ways. You're like water, and you went up to my couch, which means he remembered to this day what he did. He actually slept with one of his wives. He slept with one of his dad's wives. So Jacob is reminding him after all of these years this is what you did, and because of this, like, you're not going to be, um, you know, blessed. And, and he reminds him of this during, uh, as he's dying, and he's reminding Reuben of this, right? He defiled his father. Talk about rebellion. Talk about going against his own father. Um, a lot of times in those days, you'll see uh, throughout the Old Testament, the sons going and having sex with 
the wives of their their dad not necessarily because they wanted them um, sexually but because this is how they showed defiance how they showed control how they showed uh, you know uh, you, you think you're the man of the house no you're not and and they would um, defile them in, in that way or you know so not only do we see Cora that she's being um, that this guy Cora is part of the Levites set apart not only is is he part of the Levites which is set apart by the Lord but even a very important family in the Levite tribe okay so positionally and strategically placed near God's presence the only people to be allowed to touch or to carry I'm sorry to carry the 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 holy things okay so positional and, geogra and geographically, there was distance between these two tribes, the Reubens and the Reubenites and the Levites, right? But yet they marched and they rebelled, okay? So it's this thing about, you know, show me who you run with and I will show you who you really are, right? Because what, you know... I have friends who do marathons, like they, like they, one just did a Boston marathon. Like they, they are, they are crazy about this stuff. They love it. They would never, in their wildest like thought, they would never have a thought of ever running with me. Okay, I am not fit. I could not run a mile. I couldn't do it. They wouldn't even think of it. I don't even cross their minds because fit, fit, the way we are physically fit is complete opposite, very different. It would be ridiculous for them to call me up and say, hey, I want to, you know, I, I want to train today. You want to go for a run with me? No, because you know what? It's going to be a lot of, Gio, come on, man, pick pick her up, you know, resuscitate her, CPR, <laughs> a lot of wasted time, a lot of, you know, so we can see that. We can see that in the physical, but I want you to see it in the spiritual. Why do we keep running with people that are not spiritually compatible to us? I'm not talking about hanging out. I'm not talking about ministering or having a moment reaching out to them because that's what we're supposed to do. We are called to love all types of people. Jesus was around all kinds of people that people would have considered, you know, a bad reputation, bad, and they pointed that out in him. So I'm not saying that. I'm saying that running and walking with someone is two very different things. Okay, they may consider going on a walk with me because I can do that. You know, they might consider, you know, helping me sign up for training, encourage me to lose weight. They might consider that because they're helping me with my fitness journey, but they're not going to consider taking a run with me. And so when we are, when we are linking arms, with the wrong people, linking arms with people that cannot keep up with us, that are not running with us spiritually, that are not on the same, things happen like this. What is a Kohathite doing running with a Reubenite? Very different mentality, very different spiritually, okay? So I want you to think about that. Show me who you run with and I'll show you who you are. Because it's very often that when we run with someone in, this, in the spiritual, you know, when we run with them, we do a lot of hanging out with them. We spend a lot of time with them. We end up talking like them, acting like them, okay? So we've got to think about that. What does the Word of God say about this? Let's go to 2 Timothy, this is, uh, 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. Second Timothy 3, 1 through 5.
Kiara, Kiara, can you read that, please? But mark this, there will be troubled times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, uh, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godly, godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with them. Okay, so verse 5, having a form of godliness. So, you know, um, dressing up. <laughs> There's people that can dress up and clean up nice, but, you know, their heart is evil. Their heart is deceitful. So having a form of godliness, but denying its power from such people turn away. Okay, 2 Timothy letting us know that, to turn away. Look at 2 Corinthians 6.14. Here we go. 2 Corinthians 6.14. Hannah, can you read that? Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Okay. Do not be unequally yoked. Okay. To be yoked with someone that, you know, if the yoke is what they would put on oxen, right? So imagine having a strong ox. And then right, because it, it would be two, two oxen together, you know, with that yoke that would keep, you know, it's, it's a weighted thing that would help them for the crops, for, for that land, right? So imagine having a very strong ox and then a very weak one. The strong ox would have to what? Pull more weight, have to do more work because they are unequally yoked. Okay, and the result, it would not be a good situation. The crops probably wouldn't get done right. Um, so it makes perfect sense. Here, he's, um, Paul is trying to paint a picture. You wouldn't do that to an oxen. You wouldn't do that to animals. Why would you do that spiritually? So ladies that are not married in the room, think about that. It's very important who you marry that you are equally yoked because guess what it's gonna be a hard journey for you if you're not equally yoked it's gonna be extremely difficult and challenging and you're gonna have to see it through because you made a covenant towards God right so now you have to see that but now you're getting more of the weight you're yoked with someone that you should have never been yoked with to begin with so you've got to get this you've got to understand it now not after the fact right especially when you're running a race together right in ministry you know in ministry you want to make sure that you're at the same pace spiritually you know you want to make sure that when you're working with someone that you're in the same pace that you're able to run in a marriage that you're running at the same pace who you're running with determines who you are Okay, so this is what was happening. A Kohathite was running with a Reubenite. Why? How? That doesn't make a lot of sense. And that he pulls them aside. And now the, now the onset of what, ha what happens next makes a lot of sense. Because these relationships don't go together. There sh should not be a reason why they should be linking arms together. Okay? So... Now there's betrayal from the inside is another point that we're looking at because this is the inside group, okay? So look at uh, uh, really quickly Psalms 41, 9. Okay, Psalms 41, 9. Oh, 
Okay, let's look at Psalms 41.9. Um, and let's have Ms. Brenda, can you read that please? This is David, um, yes, 41.9. Even my close friend whom I trusted, he who shared my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. Okay, expressing someone from the inside who he shared a meal with is now li lifting a heel against me against him. Moses gets his share of it. Remember Miriam, his own sister, his own sister who protected him and watched out for him in the Nile River. His protector turned accuser later. So he got it from his sister, the inside of the inside group, but this is still the inside group because these are the Levites. And David experienced this. He had a someone who he wanted to be a great mentor to him someone who he admired the king the king of israel saul and saul tried to kill him spent most of his life running from saul hiding but yet respecting saul having the opportunity to kill him but saying no it's not right and so david knew what it was to be at the table with someone who wanted to him. So we see the same. Moses uh, was, was about to be stoned by his own people. Moses had people on the inside going, um, wanting him dead. David had someone on the inside wanting him dead. And then, of course, Jesus. So let's look at Luke 22, Matthew, Mark, Luke. So let's look at Luke. <laughs> Luke 22 22:48 Kiara, can you read that? Luke 22:48 but Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with the kiss? Okay. Someone who came up to him and kissed him, and he's being betrayed. Matthew, this is super interesting right here. Matthew 26, go to Matthew's, right? The first book in the New Testament. Matthew 26, 20 through 22. Let's get you redeemed, Honda. Can you do that? 26, 20 through 22. <laughs> when it was evening, he reclined at table with the twelve. And as they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful and began to say to him one after another, Is it I, Lord? Okay, so this is Jesus is hanging out with these 12 for three years. He's pouring his life out into them. You know, he is discipling them. Okay, he's teaching them. These 12 would soon go to do great things. But here, or not all 12 of them, right? But here he is mentioning, he's saying, someone at the table is going to betray me, okay? So um, he's mentioning this, and watch this. The interesting thing about this is in verse 22, all of his disciples are like, is it me? <laughs> I thought that was hilarious, because I thought, oh my goodness, like they all were evil. <laughs> They were all yeah. terrible, you know, but the, and then God reminded me, cause there are a lot of times where I think, God, do I do this? Do I like mess up in this way and other things, you know, and, and he's, and, and Holy Spirit reminds me, Giovanna, if you're questioning it, it's not you. Like, and so this reminds me here of them, they're questioning, 
They question their own faithfulness, their own loyalty. But the very fact that they're willing to question it points to the fact that you, know, you have no worries because you're actually questioning yourself. But I found it very interesting that all of them at that table could say that. They couldn't put it past themselves. Is it going to be me? Am I going to betray you, Lord? And I thought, wow. So Jesus, we know, we know the story, right? We have Judas who ultimately betrays him, but we have this pattern of Moses, David, Jesus. And if we look in the lives of more, we'll see that there's always some enemy right in the inside right in the inside um and i think those are the most hurtful of all because i would rather take an insult from someone who doesn't even know me <laughs> i you know um than someone close to me saying coming out of left field saying something horrible or just betraying me in some way man that is is real pain Okay, and those in ministry, we can really relate to that. If you want to do anything where you uh, are surrounded by, um, for the most part, people who don't thank you, people who don't appreciate you, people who don't know, go into ministry. It'll be oh, great no. because you'll see that. Yeah. You'll see that over and over um, how... Um, it is the most, um, it, it is, a, 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 you don't do it for that attaboy thing because you're not really going to get it at all. Um, so here we see that God, um, I'm just going to uh, end on this note. Um, we also see that the enemies, the, the, the red flag of enemies coming. And we have to understand that if we are walking with Jesus, if we are impacting the kingdom of God, you will have enemies. Um, I think because we live in this, um, you know, in the United States and, and we are women and we want to be uh, pleasers, you know, we want to please everybody. If someone doesn't like me, why? I don't understand why they don't like me. I'm lovable. Why do they like me? Because they hated Jesus. And you represent him. And you are following him with all your heart. So it makes perfect sense that they're going to hate you. They're going to hate everything about you. So it's a good thing. If you do not have enemies, if you don't have people that look at your life and say, ugh, get angst of that want to throw darts at it then you must be doing something wrong because every person in this book every person that was impactful that loved God that loved Jesus had enemies okay so this is what's happening to Moses but you know what the word of God says that he will make those enemies your footstool your footstool so we talk about climbing, but a lot of times climbing, when you rock climb, there are some parts that, I was watching this documentary where this guy was climbing, Trinity got me to watch it, and he was rock climbing without a harness, without anything, loco, but he was doing it, and he would train and train, and there were parts where he had to have the right grip, he had to have enough stretch, his leg had to stretch a certain way, and he had to have that. And his foot, if his foot could find a place where he could land it and just enough to push himself up, he could make it higher. Well, if you can think of your enemies becoming that place where you can put your foot and go to the next level, that's what the Word of God says your enemies are for you. They're your footstool. So actually, if you don't want enemies, you don't have a grip with your foot. He's making the enemies to be your footstool. In order to go to the next level in your life, you are going to have enemies. But God is going to make them your footstool. He also says he will prepare a table before your enemies. Okay? That means that he's preparing a table and your enemies are watching as he's laying out every piece of silverware, every, you know, uh, 
every item of food, every beverage, and they get to watch because he's preparing it in front of your enemies. That means blessing after blessing, favor after favor, and they're watching, okay? So I want you to get that, that you will be betrayed and you will have enemies. And all of you are called into ministry because we are all called to make disciples. So this is for you. These are things that will happen. So I want you to guard your heart against rebellion, against competition with one another. And trust and respect the role that each of us has for we are all called. I mentioned before, it's not called the fingers of Christ. It's the body of Christ. So we all have a part to play in it. And moving together um, is a beautiful thing to experience. That mm -hmm. reminded the he's preparing, preparing a table before the enemies remind me of how the he told the next generation that they're going to see the promised land in front of their parents. Oh, man, Susan, that's good. That's Holy Spirit. We're deposit that. That's good. So, so say that one more time. Say that one more time. That's good. table before my enemies yes. and he was telling the next generation of Israelites yeah. in front of their parents what they're going to get to do in the promised land yes 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 so it's like the word of God goes out and just like it went out in the people that were never going to get to the promised land and the and the, the generation that was and they had to hear it but the same thing happens in churches. The same thing happens in conferences where people pack them in. There's people in there that don't even know God, that will never get to the things that God has for them. And there's people that are ready for that word and ready to run with it. So they get to hear the word in the presence of their enemies. But I, I really like how you put that. I like uh, that you tied it in super nice with that. That yes, they are watching as God is putting, uh, laying out the table in front of them because they will reach the promised land. The next generation will. Okay, so let me pray. We'll go offline and then I, I want to hear any comments or questions. And at that time, the Israelites had become his enemies. So because of that, he was against them. He is their enemy. But he said, no, no, no. Your children are not going to be victims. Your children are going to be fine. They are going to go into the promised land. I will take care of them. I will raise them up. And this is exactly what Susan is saying. That the, the, the first generation became the enemies of God. And here they're having to watch God bless the next generation and take them into the promise and as each one dies in their anger bitterness disappointment wow incredible okay let's pray god thank you thank you for your word thank you for meeting us here you are such a good god and you keep showing us and revealing things to us god we love you and we don't ever, ever want to rebel against you or harden our hearts towards you, God. Help us remain soft. Help us remain obedient. Help us, God, as we go through betrayal, as we go through a pain, as we go through um, our enemies having to, to, to be knowing that we are to have enemies, God. Help us through that. Remind us that what you're doing, what you're doing all the while as we are walking with you, God. Help us, <coughs> Father God, to run 
with those that you would have us run with, Father God, and slow down for those who are walking behind us, that we minister to them and we um, are able to walk with them at certain times that you would have us do that, God. I thank you so much. You are so awesome. We thank you for all the blessings and everything that you've done for us. We love you. We love you. So glad that we don't experience you as an enemy, but we experience you as our Father. We experience you as grace and mercy in our lives. Thank you for giving us Jesus. Thank you for Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah.